Hey everyone, welcome to Locked On Lakers for Friday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers are going to play some kind of play-in or play-off. Is Darvin Ham up for the task? That's next. You are Locked On Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked on Lakers first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcast. It's always free. It's never behind a paywall. And Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to join a fast-growing channel with over 14,000 subscribers, Lakers fans, NBA fans. Uh, we we love to see the comments that everybody leaves on that page. We often use them in the show, and I believe, Andy, we'll be using some today in our conversation about Darvin Ham. So uh, keep that coming. Uh, make sure the engagement stays high. We really appreciate it. Uh, it really does improve the show. We want to let people know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Um, so we'll get to Darvin uh, and the confidence that you might or might not have as a Lakers fan with the Lakers heading into some kind of postseason uh, action. I mean, you could even argue, Andy, if it's just play and stuff that, you know, the higher leverage moments there for Ham. Uh, but let's do a little housekeeping ahead of Friday's game against the Suns, because to say the least, a lot of moving parts <laughs> around the league in terms of uh, what this game is going to look at look like both with the Lakers with the Suns around the NBA it's it's all very fluid dude I'm just going to be more blunt I have no effing idea what's going on man like I mean <laughs> really I cannot I, I follow this league very closely you do. both because it's my job and also because I'm a big NBA fan I would be following the NBA very closely, even if I was doing something different to earn money, I have no effing idea what's going on. Man. Like there, right. like the the amount of mental gymnastics and like seven dimensional chess that's going on just to understand the different scenarios before you even get into the idea of people trying to manipulate or rig the scenarios. Yes. Um, let's start with crazy man. It, it's ridiculous. Let's start with the Lakers, though. Um, uh, Anthony D'Angelo Russell's list is probable. Did notice, uh, did note after the game on Wednesday that his foot injury is just something that's going to be bugging him all season long. Has to be maintained, and you know all that stuff. I, I got some details actually. I, I was sitting in today with uh, on the Sedano and Kaplan show. Uh, I was with George Sedano and. Uh, George, among many things he does, including hosting at 710 ESPN, he's also does regular sideline work uh, for the NBA, uh, for ESPN's programming. And, you know, they meet with the different coaches before each game. And he had Lakers Clippers uh, Wednesday night. And he said this on the record during our show. So I'm OK repeating it. The situation with D'Lo is he has really bad calluses on his feet. And the medication that they initially used to treat the calluses essentially didn't take. So he's starting over. And as one would imagine, playing basketball on your feet with bad calluses, really, really uncomfortable, painful. Mm. Get one of those like pumice stones that we, you know, got my, I don't know how, how this works. That a pumice stone on calluses sounds. Uh, I don't, I don't want it's to contradict Andy, you, Dr. Kamenetsky, but that's it is, like it is a really very bad possible. Idea. It is very possible. I don't know what this situation is. <laughs> like, I, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to look up what are foot calluses, and I might be wrong. I'm just thinking of like, like hard, dead skin. No, I may, there, I may be like a nice, this, nice pedicure. No, I may be. This is not about making D'Angelo's feet prettier. Um, I. <laughs> The calluses may have actually gotten a little bit infected at one point, which makes it even worse. Huh. Um, so, because and the reason George mentioned this is because there had been a lot of Lakers Twitter chatter and you know, like Galaxy Brain takes that this was D'Angelo Russell staying out of games because he's more concerned about 
his next contract, or even, and this was the galaxiest, brainest take of all of them, D'Angelo's still has the same agent that he had when the Lakers traded him. And this agent has had some misgivings in the past involving D'Lo, involving Paul George, involving Julius Randle. And therefore, this agent was advising D'Lo to sit out of games in order to screw the Lakers over, which let me tell you something. If, if that's actually what's happening, and I cannot emphasize enough, I don't think it is. <laughs> but if that was, that is the absolute worst advice an agent could give a client considering there is no team better equipped to give his client the most money than the one he's currently playing for right now. Um, yeah, that is really stupid. You know, the best way for Dila to go out and make money this offseason is to go play and play well. Yes. And play well for the Lakers. Mm -hmm. Um According to the, the good people at Advanced Foot and Ankle Care Centers, um, mm -hmm. they sound reliable. Corns and calluses can cause a tremendous amount of foot pain and discomfort, and left untreated, they can result in serious potential side effects. So uh, do not poo-poo the calluses. <laughs> the side effects, though, it should be clear, do not include really bad agents giving you really bad advice. <laughs> Galaxy brain uh, free yeah. agent planning. Right. So uh, just <laughs> clarifying that, D'Lo has an actual foot issue going on. There's there, there's no agendas being played out through D'Angelo's feet. <laughs> well, we did. <laughs> Does this get back to the foot fetish thing we had the other day? No, no, okay. no. Is it there an as, No, as, as it turns out, it probably D'Lo's feet just are not... They're not aesthetically pleasing as well as being <laughs> as well as being as useful as he'd like right now. There's I just nothing. like to bring I like to make sure we're we're you know squaring the circle, so to speak, mm -hmm. putting a yeah. bow on things. Yeah. He's, he's just um, got a foot problem, man. In other, <laughs> also, uh, in other news relevant to Friday's game, uh, LeBron James and Anthony Davis are both listed as questionable. Um, we'll get back to that in a second because that could very well be directly related to what happened on Wednesday. Uh, and the game that they played second night of a back to back um, after going into OT. And, you know, there was some question as whether both of those guys would play. I was surprised they would play you, um, you know, got word earlier in the day that I did, you know, that they probably would, or at least LeBron would. And so, but either way, I think we both woke up in the morning on Wednesday, oh. not necessarily expecting both of them to play. They Dude, did. When I saw Mo Bamba was activated, I was like, oh, AD really may not play. And so if those guys, now can't play on Friday because they did play on Wednesday. It does call into question the larger strategy of whether or not it was worth it to have those guys play, particularly uh, the entire game, uh, and, and particularly since they lost. Um, other bits of housekeeping that are important for Friday's game, the Phoenix Suns locked up the four spot in the Western Conference. They beat a Denver team that was sitting everyone um at home on wednesday uh denver's locked up in the first seed so phoenix comes to this game on friday in the second night of a back-to-back -back, having clinched uh, a spot and has nothing to play for in one direction or the other that could obviously influence how they use particularly kevin durant um but also booker also chris paul you get another opportunity to play these guys they, they would have another opportunity to get a little bit of a tune-up before the end of the year um Th that game ended as we record 10 minutes ago. So we, I, I don't know what they're going to do. They, I don't know if they're going to say anything after the game. Uh, we could wake up on Friday with more information about that. But obviously, that could influence the way the game is played. In terms of the Lakers moving up uh, to the sixth seed, um, that is related to in part uh, to what Golden State does. Golden State is playing Sacramento on Friday night. The Kings, Andy, are sitting potentially De'Aaron Fox, uh, DeMontis Sabonis, Malik Monk, uh, Trey Lyles, <sighs> um, basically everyone. Um, so they are who they're not totally locked into the three. Uh, they're locked into the three C, but they don't necessarily aren't locked into an opponent. Uh, let me rephrase that. No, they're not locked in. They they're could not move up I was going to say they could move up to the two if Memphis loses twice and. Um, Sacramento wins twice, but it does not necessarily look like the Kings are trying to do that in part because people are wondering if they're trying to pick their opponent, but that's that's something for Locked on Kings to get into. Um, point being, the Lakers, after all this, could still move up to sixth if they win twice and Golden State loses once. 
Uh, Golden State finishes the season at Portland. That probably is not a game they're going to lose. And so if Sacramento lo- uh, doesn't play most of their players on Friday, that obviously influences LA's opportunity to move up. Um, the Lakers can, the best way for the Lakers to finish seventh is to win both of their games. If they do that, they will be the seventh seed. If they do not, there is a chance they could drop down to eighth. Um, possibly further, I think. Yes. Um, the, again, a lot of different uh, <laughs> configurations can happen that can move the Lakers to the nine. A lot has to happen. Um, it's not likely, but it is far from impossible. And I go back to my original statement. I have no effing idea what's going on. Yeah. And one thing that does help the Lakers is the Pelicans and the Timberwolves finish the season playing each other. Uh, so someone's got to lose that game, uh, which obviously benefits the Lakers. So I, I want to ask two questions to you. We will get into the, the Darvin Ham question is that we, we, we teased with is, you know, the Lakers are going to be playing playoff games of some sort or another. Do you, how much faith do you have in Darvin Ham? And then my other question is how whether Lakers tactically made the right decision playing Anthony Davis and LeBron James if it put their availability into question for tonight's game. So that's all that's next. Lock on Lakers is brought to you by Nissan and Nissan's most electric player of the week is brought to you by the all new all electric 2023 Nissan Aria and the award goes to LeBron James Sunday versus the Rockets. He had what Darvin Ham referred to as an effortless Triple double, smooth, elegant, and then after an ordinary by LeBron standards, regulation versus Utah, he controlled overtime to secure the win, brought some electricity back to his team, and then managed to power up and summon his strength after an absolutely dreadful first half Wednesday night versus the Clippers to put up 30 and a half and at least provide a glimpse of of what could be ahead in the playoffs, assuming the Lakers are in it, of course. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin you to your seat power and premium intelligence all in one EV, the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Um, let's get to Darvin here in a second, but just you know, real quick, do you, did the Lakers do this right? Um, you know, the Clipper game, the, the benefits of winning the game on Wednesday were enormous. It really were. I mean, it's, it is not an overstatement. If the Lakers win that game, they have an excellent chance of finishing sixth. Sixth is a lot better than seventh or eighth. You have, Not only do you avoid the play-in where anything can happen, even in the seven or the eight, you have two cracks to win one game. Fine. Uh, if you don't, you're out and you still have to play the games. The, the greatest benefit probably for the Lakers beyond that is the fact you get about five games, five days off to rest, to heal, and all that. So it really was a, a, a game that was worth trying to win. But I would ask this, if it costs them the opportunity to potentially win Friday against the Suns, um, where you're now jeopardizing you know, a seven seed, um, did the Lakers play this right? I think they played it right in terms of their decision to play LeBron and AD because assuming that there was not assuming that there was not a medical setback risk for either one of these guys particularly AD because it's always seemed like mm-hmm. he's the guy with more of that immediately looming even acknowledging both of them I think could be under the knife this offseason that this was a really important opportunity for the Lakers and they they have worked extremely hard to put themselves in the potential place where they can get themselves into the playoffs outright. And Mm -hmm. depending on how things shook out, if they won this game, you know, maybe they would even have the opportunity to sit everybody Sunday versus Utah and extend, and extend that, that break that they would have while the plane is going on and they're automatically in the playoffs you can argue, and and you and I frankly did during Thursday's show, that Darwin kept these guys in too long. Like as as much as it was reassuring to see LeBron look more like LeBron, and in that second half, and there was definitely some energy that was spread throughout the team, and they pushed the Clippers. And this was not the Clippers letting their foot off the gas. They played Kawhi Leonard. The entire second the half. The entire second half. Right. 43 no, minutes he played in that the, game. The Clippers wanted this game badly. So I, I am taking away nothing from what the Lakers did in the second half. You can say they never threatened to actually win, but they chipped it, they chipped away through their skill, not the Clippers letting off yep. the gas or playing with their food or whatever. 
Clippers wanted this game really effing bad. You can argue that Darwin should have been, I guess, the proverbial adult in the room. And yeah, just I, had said, the, I had the throw the damn towel meme queued up like at least four times in that game. Right. I would say that is the argument that you can make, that he should have just said, guys, it's not going to happen. Really proud of you for giving it this shot. But we got to think about Friday and then Sunday. But no, if there was no, if there was de- determined that there was no serious risk of a setback, this game was too important for them not to play. What, no, what, what they really needed to do is not F around against Utah and put them away the way they were capable of putting a team like that away. And you buy yourself some extra rest. Right. Maybe would it, would that have been the difference? In the, I don't know, but it couldn't hurt. And then, you know, to that point, Houston, um, Indiana, you know, you start mm-hmm. now is where you really start going through the list of all of these games over the course of the year. We're like, man, I wish I could have that one back. Man, I wish, like, you know, the, the problem the Lakers put themselves in was that they basically had to go you know, to get into that six spot. They, they, they basically had to run the table. Mm-hmm. And, that's not easy to do. Like you're, you're going to have games like Utah. They happen. They probably shouldn't, and you wish they wouldn't, but they do. Um, and that leads to scheduled losses, like you have against the Clippers, which is essentially what you know. You go through the beginning of every season, and everybody does that. You circle five or six games on the on the schedule. You're like, well, that's probably going to be a loss, just because. You know, end of a road trip, coming back, they're on the, they've sat for four days. Like all, you can do the math on these games and figure out where the schedule losses are. Um, you're right. Like, it's like this crystallizes all of these opportunities. Houston, I think being the most recent where at least they won the game against Utah, but like that Houston game, come on. I mean, it's funny. You and I talked about the last seven games needing to win five and two to feel safe about the play in. And mm-hmm. they're on pace to yeah. meet the, the baseline that we met. Like, it's not even that they've been playing bad on this road trip. As a whole, they've actually played. It was played, a great road trip. Right, exactly. They went, th- they, went, they went four and one on this road trip. I keep thinking, it's funny, I keep thinking of Utah as a loss because I'm so yeah, no. mad about the way they handled it. In my mind, yeah, they no, lost They, they won game. the game. They did win that no, game. No, I know they did. They won that overtime Utah game, but in my head, I keep thinking of it as a loss because I was really, really pissed at how the whole thing laid out. They've done, for the most part, the things that you need. Just the problem is the margins are so tight and there's so many other variables that you can't control, which, to answer your original question, explains why they played LeBron and AD in the first place. So, you know, people in the the chat were you know on twitter certainly on the youtube channel andy were upset with with darvin on wednesday's game you know playing i saw people criticizing him for playing both uh uh schroeder you know you know the playing schroeder too much playing reeves too much it's like playing uh troy d-lo brown. too much troy brown too much it's like at some point you're running out of guys like you know d-lo was not playing particularly well but if you don't play d-lo and you don't play um Schroeder, it's like okay, well, somebody's got to play, and you know, but it, all of it I think centers into the the angst factor that people have about Darwin's rotations, and you know, the Lakers have played significantly better with a better roster. Um, the guys, the people who break these offenses down, like they you know, go play by play, you know, the Alex Reglas of the world and, you know, Cranjus McBasketball and, you know, Tim underscore NBA, Lakers exceptionalism pod. If you don't follow him, you should like really chart all these things. Like the, the offense, the play calling has been much better and the, you know, the scheme has been much better, all this stuff, but there are still a lot of criticisms of who Darwin puts on the floor, when, what his in-game adjustments are, and now actually that they're going to be playing high-leverage postseason games. And there's a lot of question, I think, from Lakers fans as to how confident they are in Ham's work because overall, I would say most fans are not thrilled with the results in his first season. No, I think that's uh, fair. That is a, that is a fair statement that you're making. When we get back, actually, I, I want to get a little bit into that question of – Darvin's decisions during this game against the Clippers and rotations because I think it can illustrate the difference between legitimate criticisms of Darvin's decisions with rotations 
and one where it's like you have to just acknowledge what's in front of them. So we'll get into that next. Lock on Lakers, though, is brought to you by FanDuel. And the NBA playoffs, they are around the corner, hopefully involving the Lakers. And there is no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app, safe, secure, super easy to use, and you can bet on everything from the money line to point scorers. To- or you can get saucy with an exclusive bet like the two by three, two three pointers scored in the first three minutes. And FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlays. So don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000, a grand in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Again, make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, so let's let's look at that Clipper game because I mean you're right. There, I think it's a, it's a the most recent one they've played, but it is filled with a lot of things that get to this discussion about Darwin, about coaching generally. Um, that I think is is important. You know, as the Lakers go into these you know postseason games, and I, I'm I'm including the the play in as a postseason basically a postseason game um so what did you what did you pull well uh saw a lot of comments from uh from viewers about darvin's the rotations but also who he played who he didn't play from eric dane ham was out coached as usual his rotations and timeout management were awful no excuse not to play bomba or max when he saw how the role players lacked energy aggressiveness couldn't get stops on the perimeter Ruby Kino, Ham should have given more playing time to Lonnie, Bamba, Christie. Very obvious. The other guys had no legs. Uh, Crotacon, Ham had other capable players at his disposal, well rested and definitely capable in the ball in the hoop. And then Lakers fan LBJ pointing out that Walker, being Lonnie Walker, deserves playing time. He can match up with Powell because of his speed. Darvin Ham loves the three guard lineups and he played Troy Brown, always plays Troy Brown, even if he has a bad game. Look, if this game was important enough that LeBron and AD would deem it necessary to play the second end of this back-to-back, then by definition, it is a game too important that you can't just start throwing in random guys to be playing random minutes with other teammates they they haven't been on the court with other than like a shoot-around in the last month. You can't do that. Like no. if, if you're going to start doing that stuff, just sit LeBron and AD and try to make it just a big energy game with all the role players. But you you can't you can't go half measures on this. No, I and I I I think you know Bamba is a guy who you know hasn't he hasn't played in a, what is it like a month almost um, something like that a little less than that. But like he's not been available, hasn't practiced, hasn't you know been around the team, whatever. And he barely knows his we're teammates. Not, we're not and we're not talking about. AD's back. You know, of course, you put him in the lineup. You know, Le- you know, the LeBron is back. Of course, you put him. In- Mo Bamba wasn't in the rotation in, in Orlando. It's like the idea that Mo- you you have to play Mo Bamba. He is he is a, a guy who you know provides pr- potentially some rim protection that maybe you didn't have, but he's not like a stout interior defender who's going to keep you from being bullied or something like that. And you know, defensive rotations are tricky things and. Communication is a tricky thing. Five minutes of Bamba made a difference. Probably not. Could you play? But like difference making, no. And Max Christie, I am sorry. I love the potential of this of of the kid. It is like you point out. He hasn't played a, a meaningful game in six weeks for he's the Lakers. Played something like five hundred NBA minutes, right? And, and he's a one and done college player. And it and if if you you know he is he is back to being a concept as much as he is a player, and I'm not saying Christie didn't play well when he played earlier in the season. He did for a 19 year old one and done second round pick. If you go back and you break down the metrics and you break down the numbers and you look at his net rating and some of these other things and you know a host of of analytical data. He wasn't effective when he was on the floor. He looked like a player who had potential, and I'd love to. I love that he's on the roster. And if I'm another team and I could pick up Max Chris, I would do it. 
But in terms of playing meaningful minutes in high leverage games based on what he did before, and is it no? If you were going to be looking to do something like that, then dude, just sit LeBron and AD. Just sit them. Don't play them. But if you're going yeah. to be playing your rotation, play the rotation. And I, I just I I give I get I am I am more sympathetic to coaches, I think, again, than a lot of fans are, because I just I feel like so much of this ultimately is up to the players. Um, I feel like, you know, so much of this is up to the roster construction. And I feel like, you know, lo and behold, the minute the Lakers got a better roster, suddenly Darvin, you know, Darvin Ham is winning games. And, you know, Lakers fans get really frustrated really quickly. The loudest voices tend to be the ones who um, kind of pipe up when when the team loses. Um, and when they lose, it's Darvin's fault. I've not seen a lot of great work, Darvin, you know, for the, what are they, 15 and 8 now or 14 and 8, whatever it is, 15 and 8 since the, the trade deadline. But like they're winning a lot more games and they were winning games without, um, with, you know, without a lot of their players. I think for the most part, the head coach um, is responsible for keeping the group together, for, um, you know, buy in for stuff like that and for broadly the schemes that you you go into games with your game plan and i think those things have been pretty good over the course of the year he where he, is he great with in-game adjustments the people who are, are are i would say no and the people who are better at detecting these things tend to agree that that's a place where the, the lakers don't always adjust well in games there have been moments i think where they have you know, we were talking a, you know, a few games ago about Rui Hachimura playing in the second half. Other guys sitting who had played early, you know, leaning on Rui later, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I think th I think that stuff is there. Am I wildly confident in him in you know to not make some sort of tactical error or something like that, a rotation error in a you know play-in game? I wouldn't say I'm 100% confident in that, but I feel as good about him as I would about most probably coaches in the league because um, I think most of them are kind of in a middle group. I mean, look, to put this in, I guess, sort of a comparative perspective, if I were to compare Darwin versus Frank Vogel the year the Lakers won the championship, I will be honest, I would have had more confidence in Frank Vogel. I also think Frank Vogel... Sure had had a very good year coaching that team and also had a team that fit very well the way he likes to play. You know, contrast that. Frank Vogel's last season with the Lakers, while he obviously was not given an ideal roster for him to work with or, frankly, anybody to work with, I don't think it was some of Frank Vogel's best coaching either. I, th I think Vogel let his unhappiness with the roster – often color the way he would he would use the roster in ways that did the team or himself no favors. But where, where, where I think Frank really lost out in his final season was in the stuff that came before, is was in the locker room management, was in the sure. buy-in, was in the right. – and stuff like that. And so he didn't – he never had it. And no. the Lakers undercut him from the beginning. And But that kind of gets to my point, which is coaching and the ability is so contextual. And I, I, I just kind of lumped Darvin in there with that middle group of guys who I think are good at some things, bad at others. He's clearly, they're winning more with a better roster. Um, and he's gotten the, you know, the, the buy-in, like I think on par or on balance, there's a lot of good there. You know, in-game tactical stuff often is results-based and, takes a long time i think for a lot of these guys to to really develop some guys are always better than others um and ultimately right. it's like D, did you have enough guys make shots the other day in terms of like the raw analysis i'm not talking about like the the guys who really understand it but for a lot of the you know chatter whether it's podcasts like ours fans on youtube pages or whatever if you know the same shots whatever three of them go in versus three of them don't whole conversations change it, it can but i think there's also I think there's also process evaluations that you mm -hmm. can make that are just did it follow logic or not? And for sure, for example, and that's what I know. That's what you try to do. That's what I try to do. Um, but that in doing that, kind of, I think that leads us to criticize the parts like where he's leaning on lineups earlier in the season that just didn't 
makes sense. Look, even if you think, I guess the question I would have, you don't have to answer it now, but just the way I would think about it is if you think, even if you think Darwin is somewhere in that middle, whether you think he's in the upper half of that circle or the lower half of that circle could make all the difference between getting through to the next round or advancing right. or whatever, because it's I maybe. have concerns Darwin's going to get out coached. I'm just going to be flat. Could, out yeah, there, I, I, that's, that is a live possibility. I, um, and it's but, not even, uh, it's not that I don't believe in Darwin's potential. It's not that I think he's an awful coach. I think that there are, there are quick twitch decision-making issues that I think are, could end up the difference between Darwin pushing the right buttons and not. And sure. Those decisions matter. But I also think, and we can leave it here because I'm sure we're going to talk about this more. Most fan bases think the same thing about their coach. Right. But I'm, you know, I, I would say they, I go to go listen, go watch the, the, you know, the I, Steve Kerr has won multiple titles. Look, and you the and Warriors I covered fans Phil, rip covered, his rotations constantly. You and I covered the Kobe Powell team under Phil Jackson. We heard plenty of complaints about Phil, but. I'm removing that stuff from the way I'm evaluating this. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the way I see it. I'm not talking about the criticism. We've already said there are criticisms that are legitimate criticisms that aren't. I'm talking about the stuff I think matters, not the consensus of the fan base. And my, right. my concern is that there could be some, there could be situations where Darwin is either slow to adjust, doesn't know the adjustment to make, or doesn't adjust at all. So right. I think the in-game adjustment thing is probably the biggest red flag, everything else. But um, I just, pretty, I, I, I tend to think, good size tend flag. To think, no, it is. But I also <laughs> tend to think that the same red flag applies. I, I think we, I think we underestimate how much that flag might apply to other coaches uh, because we watch and dissect every single Lakers game. And it's easy to assume that those same issues don't exist with other that coaches, is, with other teams. That is true. Um, that is true. All right, so we'll talk about this more, though. I, I just think, I, to me, it's a fascinating topic that goes beyond just Darvin Ham to the whole ecosystem of kind of the influence of coaches and what they do, uh, which is a subject that I've long been interested in. Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to see the show. Um, we will be back after Friday night's game, which hopefully people will play in unless they're on the Suns, in which case they really ought to rest. They really should. It's really important that Kevin Durant stay healthy, sit him down, Booker, all those guys. Kevin, uh, Chris Paul is very old. Um, all right, so we'll see everybody after Friday's game.